my background before I became a YouTuber, um, I was my undergrad is in electrical engineering. My master's degrees are in artificial intelligence and optimization. So basically two different kinds of math. You know, I focused a lot on computer vision and then radar vision. So mixing sensors from cameras and radars, which is how I got started on YouTube. Also, you know, I was covering Tesla's back when they had radars in them. And I was talking about like sensor fusion and Tesla's data advantage from that perspective. Uh, after I graduated uh, from my graduate school, I was a rocket scientist at MIT for about eight years. So I focused on working with telescopes and radars to track rocket launches and missile tests. Did that for eight years, worked in the private sector for a little bit. And then when the pandemic hit, like everybody else, I was stuck at home, interested in YouTube. I've been investing for about seven or eight years at that point. And I was tracking Kathy Wood, you know, ARK Invest, a very big Tesla proponent. Um, and I was noticing that people on YouTube weren't answering the questions of like, why is Kathy Wood investing in this innovative company? What makes Roku innovative? What makes Teladoc innovative? What makes Tesla innovative? The content at the time on YouTube was more about Kathy Wood bought the stock. She's a great investor. So you should go buy the stock. So I just came up with this idea like, hey, I'm in a good position like academically and career wise to talk about the science behind these stocks, right? Like, you know, what is special about Tesla versus other car companies? Why can't Apple TV and Fire TV beat Roku, even though these companies are hundreds of times bigger than Roku is? Like, what is going on here? So that's that's how I got my start on YouTube. I'm drawing heavily from my academic and career background at MIT. So like, yeah, natural fit. I love it. So Alex knows what the he's talking about. <laughs> In this <laughs> very narrow background. space, right? <laughs> like, you know, if you look at my channel today, it's all yeah. chips. It's like AI and chips, like... And that's it. I, I almost cover nothing else anymore because I try to stick inside that tiny circle of confidence. I love it. No, I, it's it's I mean, it's it's obvious just hearing you speak. It's I mean, you're such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this stuff, man, truly. And, and then, Alex, just real quick, uh, super casual convo. Uh, obviously, this is the first time we've met. Um, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm an NVIDIA noob. So sure. uh, like sure. And so the, my questions are probably going to be uh, perhaps elementary, but my my thought process here is that it's for I'm kind of trying to put myself in the seat of the audience that may not be super familiar with the story to try and sort of uh, bring questions forward that are framed in a way that are may, perhaps different than than other places. Uh, that's one of the things that we try to do on this channel is like try to bring like. Uh, sort of new insights, even though it might be at an elementary level, maybe that people aren't going down a certain path while thinking about a story. And then Hans is the is the crazy smart one of the two. So then he'll give you actually good questions. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. Do, I'll do my best. And sorry, I, yeah. like I watched your channel for a bit. You're primarily yeah. a Tesla channel. Is that right? Like, is it fair to say yeah. your audience is like very Tesla focused? So I would say so. Yeah, I would say it's majority uh, uh, pro Tesla. Um, my background is I so I worked at the company from 17 to 21, a little over awesome. four years. I've been invested in the story since 2012. So it's like it's one of those things is like I it's just part of me. And uh, when I started the channel, it was kind of like a, it was super hobby because I had just left the company with, uh, you know, with financial independence. And my wife and I were like, I didn't know what to do. And I was losing my mind five weeks in into my, you know, retirement. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you want to call it and i'm like okay, i'll do a youtube channel and then like two and a half years later i'm still doing it <laughs> dude that's awesome so, yeah yeah it's crazy yeah and so that's that's so that's my background and i think what's the nvidia piece what's really fascinating to me is that it, it's sort of like you know you guys were talking briefly you know what i jumped on nvidia has set up this uh a foundation for the last i don't even know like the last five to ten years that's allowed them to come to this point and it seems like in the last 12 months, the market has, they, they've realized that uh, yeah. half, you know, partly because of uh, people are understanding the game changing nature of AI. But I think the other variable is that it started showing up on the PL. And I think that was like a, like a very important thing for the company was like, check this out. We are really the only, I don't want to call it monopoly, but I don't know of any other company that is able to lay out the hardware foundation for AI the, the way NVIDIA has. So I guess, I guess my question is, you know, NVIDIA now is recognized as this uh, AI behemoth, just the, just the way I think about it. It's like yeah. they've, they've 
come forward with this uh, with their ability to create hardware that companies can utilize to create AI tools, whatever you want to call it, be it Tesla's FSD or, you know, ChatGPT or whatever else uh, other solutions you want to talk about. And then so my, my, I guess my big thing is like, as this technology matures into the next 10, 20 years or whatever, is NVIDIA's goal to just be the primary provider of these chips that's going to allow AI to come on it you know, come to its own or are there other variables that's going to allow to, uh, nvidia to say hit another uh, i don't know 2x 3x 5x not even just from a stock perspective but from let's say the value proposition perspective help me contextualize that a little bit better yeah so uh, i think that's a great question um the primary thing that they're providing today for sure uh is the gpus and really i i would take a step back and i would say they're not really gpus anymore right like fundamentally NVIDIA supplied GPUs to gamers for a long time, right? Uh, and what they do now is they supply AI data center infrastructure, right? It turns out that the fundamental science behind GPUs, this idea of really parallel computing, is also really useful for things beyond graphics processing, right? So AI being the primary example. Um, so when I think of like the H100 GPU, that B100 GPU, um, the the line I draw in my head is I say, hey, these are really AI accelerators. And so the distinction there is you're running neural networks on them. You're not necessarily like doing ray tracing and all these things for gaming. So like GPUs versus accelerators, right? So I think primarily right now, NVIDIA is going to be known as the AI data center hardware provider, right? Um, what makes NVIDIA special versus other companies that are trying to do the same thing is they're really the only one working with every other company doing it. So for example, we look at Google developing their own TPUs, but they don't really sell that to people. They sell access to it on Google Cloud. For example, you look at Amazon Web Services, Inferentia, and Tranium chips. Well, that stays in AWS, right? Um, and then Microsoft Azure, same thing. So but all three of those data centers will have A100s, H100s, B100s, and so on. So that's like the big differentiator between the cloud providers and what NVIDIA is doing in the data center space. And now let me answer like the second part of your question. So on top of this AI hardware infrastructure, there's a software called CUDA. CUDA is basically the language at a high level that people use to write software and services and applications in the language of these GPUs. And so CUDA is really its own ecosystem and it's proprietary to NVIDIA. Today, NVIDIA doesn't really monetize CUDA separately from the GPUs. It's just, that's how you interface with these GPUs. They are actually starting to do that. So to the next part of your question is, is it just a hardware play long-term? I do believe there's going to be monetization on the software side. Um, primarily through what they just announced at GTC called NIMS, NVIDIA Inference Microservices, also called NIMS. And what they're trying to do there is package up all of the libraries and all of the you know, software and all of the sort of drivers and firmware and all of these things for their GPUs and for these large language models that people want to deploy, whether it's off of Hugging Face or proprietary model or what have you, and they're trying to build a service that charges, I'm going to, you know, let's double check these numbers, but I believe it's 400 and sorry, $4,500 per GPU per year or $1 per GPU per hour, right? So, and what they do is they maintain all the packages and all that kind of stuff. So you don't have to worry about updating the right libraries for this AI application you want to build. NVIDIA will take care of that for you and do all of the optimization and all of this other stuff. Kind of like if you have the NVIDIA service on your desktop and it's like you can download different drivers for different games and they come with different optimizations and you kind of don't need to worry about it anymore. You just say, hey, I'm about to load up this video game and NVIDIA's software goes, got it. I, you're running this hardware. You're trying to run the software. I'm going to make sure to, up, to do a little bit of magic to make sure you're having the most optimized experience for that piece of software specifically. That's what they're bringing to the table now for large language models, large vision models, and all that stuff in data centers, if that makes any sense. That's what NIMS is trying to be. Got it. Okay. And so if 
let, let me see if I can sort of. Sorry, yeah, that was a lot. I, I'll, no, I'll try to talk it up better. I, yeah. No, it's no, no, no. You're honestly, this is perfect. Like the way you're going about this, is absolutely perfect. What the, the, what I try to do is I try to take everything in and I try to like put it into a, a, sh, a like a short sentence for myself so I can store it away in my brain. And so let, let me let me see if I can do this properly here and, and correct me where I'm wrong. So where where Nvidia is trying to go, this is this is going to sound simplistic and but literally correct me where, where I went wrong here is that they're trying to create almost like a AI coder OS type thing where they're going to be the provider of hardware and say whatever software solutions that come packaged together and they can decide how to monetize that however if it's monthly or by hour or whatever but essentially they're trying to create an ecosystem for the next generation of coding which is going to be AI based coding and then they're not going to be they're not going to keep it to themselves. They're just going to allow anyone who wants to jump on that technology to jump on that technology. Is that a, is that a, I would say at a high level, it? that's pretty fair. There, there's like a pretty big distinction. You know, like when I think of CUDA, I, I almost think of like, you know, think of it as an app language, but specifically for GPUs, right? So software and services from other companies get built on top of CUDA. CUDA is the way you interface with NVIDIA GPUs. And so when people are, when businesses and NVIDIA's competitors are complaining, complaining about vendor lock-in, what they're saying is NVIDIA's hardware forces you to use CUDA to develop and accelerate your applications, your software, right? Um, if you were developing on AMD and Intel and all these things, they're pushing for open source. They're pushing for open source, in my opinion, this is not a fact now, um, because they know that the CUDA ecosystem is huge and owned by NVIDIA. So they're kind of like the Android parallel, for lack of a better word, right? Of course, they're going to say, hey, this is a walled garden. You don't want to be locked in because they're sitting outside that garden, right? So Got it. Makes perfect sense. Thanks. Cool. So a couple of questions there on that. Um, I want to go back to hardware in a second, but just quickly... Can you help me understand is, you know, do any of the other GPU manufacturers, whether it's Intel, whether it's AMD um, or anyone else that's in this game, do they actually support CUDA? Um, you know, are they doing the work to make it compatible with their hardware? Or if you're making any of these other choices, are you basically outside of CUDA? So I, I do think there are a few different efforts. I'm not sure if it's primarily by you know, other GPU makers or by third parties. Um, I don't think it's really about having other hardware support CUDA as much as it is easy, making it easy to translate CUDA to other pieces of hardware so you don't have to restart from scratch, right? So think about it more like, hey, I want to run on CUDA for NVIDIA and other ways for AMD and Intel. I'm going to create a translator that makes me, makes it easier to make that transition um, one important piece of context that I think will really shape this whole discussion and hopefully give clarity is like data centers and consumers work completely differently, right? So when I choose an NVIDIA GPU, I'm not going to, that means I didn't choose an AMD GPU, right? Kind of like if I buy a Tesla, I'm not buying a Mercedes or whatever, right? I, I kind of pick one and that's the winner. Data centers don't work like that. Data centers are large portfolios. They're whole ecosystems of hardware from many different vendors, right? They're, you're going to find AMD GPUs, Intel Gaudi chips, NVIDIA GPUs in the same data center. And the reason for that is they all do different things differently. And data centers serve many different kinds of workloads for many different kinds of customers who have their own computing needs. So this isn't a conversation where a data center picks NVIDIA and that's it. They don't pick AMD. They don't pick Intel. What we're really talking about in the future, if we're looking from an investor perspective or just a technologist perspective, is what is that mix going to be 10 years out? Do we think that when it comes to these heavy AI training workloads, where is most of that work going to be done on? In my opinion, NVIDIA GPUs. If you look at inference workloads, where is that going to be done? That's where I think the big battleground is right now. When you look at different models that are optimized for different pieces of hardware, why are they optimizing for those? Things like that. So just let's just remember data centers are large portfolios and they're not choosing one or the other. They're over time growing their mix in a different way to adjust for their own clientele. I hope that's useful. Yeah, that's really useful. So 
in thinking about the hardware, and then we'll move a little bit more into the software because there's a lot more to the software side for NVIDIA than just CUDA. That's, you know, like totally. a piece and it's a, a big piece. Um, but, you know, they're also doing a lot of really bleeding edge work on the interfaces, you know, the networking from chip to chip. And that, you know, as we, we have really moved beyond now a supercomputer being this, you know, a single thing that just like Jensen says, right now a supercomputer is a data center. And so you really need to maximize the ability of, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of these high capacity accelerator chips to be able to communicate with each other at high speed. Yeah. And it seems like that's, you know, NVIDIA almost has a bigger lead in that single thing than than any other piece at this point in time. So, you know, they're they're NV Link and they're InfiniBand and um the DPU processor yeah, the that they're making now, are those uh, pieces of hardware that are also going to be compatible with any of the other, you know, hardware manufacturers like AMD or Intel, or is that going to be inside of the walled garden? That's a really good question. I don't know if it must be inside the walled garden, but I think right now it is inside the walled garden, right? So the the outside the walled, walled garden equivalent of InfiniBand, I think is Ethernet, right? So, and outside of NVLink, I'm sure there's, there's another equivalent and it's just escaping me. So these technologies are really designed to help interface and network many, many NVIDIA GPUs together. That's not to say other networking solutions are bad. I just think that NVIDIAs are optimized for their stack. You know what I mean? So it's a good question whether you can just use InfiniBand with AMD. My suspicion is no. My suspicion is there's some sort of magic that makes it work with NVIDIA hardware. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's not written the same way to work with um, AMD hardware. The reason I have that suspicion is I know that there's a lot of in networking computing being done. It's not just like wires that you plug in, you know, these systems are also computers of their own. For example, mm -hmm. NVLink isn't just a link between chips. There's also an NVLink chip. So that kind of matters because it only knows how to talk to certain chips. Right. Um, yep. so my, my suspicion is Everything that NVIDIA acquired through their acquisition of Mellanox, which is what you're talking about with NVLink, InfiniBand, and the Bluefield DPUs, is going to work with NVIDIA hardware primarily. And do you have any visibility into, you know, really looking at somebody like a Google or an Amazon Web Services where they're, you know, doing their own TPUs or they're doing the Tranium uh, computers? how are they solving or are they solving, you know, are those more localized? Are they able to do a large, you know, say an exaflop plus of coordinated AI acceleration compute? Um, and if so, how, how are they doing that? Because that definitely requires a lot of that high speed networking. Yeah. That, so that's a great question. I actually don't know. So my, the way I, understand all of these cloud service providers is they're actually doing something completely separate, right? They, they definitely have their own hyperscale computing nodes and they're using their own infrastructure to build those out, right? If they're built with NVIDIA, they're going to be using the InfiniBand to connect them together. If they're with AMD, Intel, and so on, they're probably connected via Ethernet. And, you know, I just want to be clear, Ethernet is not a bad solution. It's just a different solution from InfiniBand, right? Um, why does that matter? Because what these cloud service providers are actually trying to do by building their own chips and their own separate infrastructure, it's not to compete with NVIDIA, right? What it's at, NVIDIA's chips are expensive, and I'm sure we're going to get into the pricing and all that kind of stuff, right? So what they want to do as a portfolio of hardware is make sure that they're only using NVIDIA's GPUs for the best workloads that make sense to use that, that you don't want to run a cheap workload on an expensive chip, right? So what they're doing is they're making their own CPUs and GPUs and accelerators to take as much work off of the more expensive infrastructure that they buy versus build so that they're cost optimizing their entire data center, right? So if I know I have a lot of low level workloads, I'll just build a chip that can handle those. And now those aren't on the NVIDIA H100s and B100s anymore. 
Now I can reserve those for more specialized applications like training of massive large language models, right? So does that make, does that answer your question or? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and so, but over time, is it fair to say that it's likely, and, and I think you alluded to this a little bit earlier, that it more and more compute is going to be on those NVIDIA chips because they're, they're specializing in the next generation of of where we're going. Is that a fair, it, it, I'm trying to conceptualize, like if we're yeah. going down five to 10 years, is that a fair statement? You're, you're asking the question that's at the heart of every investor's mind on NVIDIA. The, the real question you're asking is this, how durable is NVIDIA's monopoly today, right? Correct. So if you believe that in 10 years- How'd you read my mind? Yeah, yeah, it, like, <laughs> you know, because I have the same question, right? So right now what's what's going on is, Training, which is the more compute intensive training versus inference, right? Training these large models, whether it's a large language model, whether it's a large vision model, action model, whatever. Training takes a lot of coordinated GPU efforts. Coordinated GPU efforts take a lot of power. Power costs a lot of money, right? The reason NVIDIA has this pricing monopoly today, I'm calling it a monopoly. I don't mean a literal one. I mean, you know, they sort of, they behave like a monopoly today is because they offer the best price to performance on their accelerator infrastructure. When you combine, you know, the H100s, the InfiniBand, the NVLinks, all that put together, what you get is a data center that takes the least amount of power for the most amount of compute that you can get today. So they price it accordingly, right? Like, you know, if you want the best, you're going to pay for the best. What you get in return overall is a lower footprint for the same amount of compute. Footprint in terms of data center space, right? Fewer racks and footprint in terms of power, right? Which means in the same amount of space and power budget, you can fit more compute if you buy NVIDIA's products. That's the trade-off there. More compute means you can trade in large, larger large models, right? Like even larger models, even larger models will perform better than your competitors. So you're buying this competitive advantage today. Whether that's going to be true for inference is a whole separate ball game. So if you look at what Intel and AMD are targeting, all of their benchmarks or the majority of their benchmarks focus on inference. That's the other side of training, right? So training for the Tesla audience is where Tesla sits down and they train the self-driving 12.3.3 to, you know, tons and tons of video comes in, what comes out is here is what this should, what the chip should do to control the car in this situation when you see pixels like this. That model goes on the chip. Now, when you're driving on the road for real, you're constantly doing inference. It's looking at new pixels that it's never seen before, and it's outputting new controls based on that information, right? So chat GPT, training the model. Inference is where you actually prompt the model and it goes, oh, I've seen prompts like this before. I know what to do next, right? Inference is cheaper to do. Inference is smaller to do. Inference will one day, according to most people, most experts, move to consumer devices. You'll be able to do inference on your phone, whereas you don't, no one really suspects you'll be doing training on your phone, right? So the question is, okay, NVIDIA doesn't really make phone chips today, laptop CPUs today, for example, right? They do make GPUs for laptops and so on. So where is the ultimate durability coming from? Are we going to be training models forever? If so, I do think NVIDIA has that kind of forever moat, kind of like we've seen Google with search, right? Nobody is displacing Google on search. What's happening is search is changing to answers, right? Like we're getting found fun fundamentally new ways to deliver information to people. And Google's not on the top of that anymore, right? NVIDIA, I suspect for training will be the same way. It will be training. They'll have the monopoly on that forever. And there's two questions. Will a new type of chip come along that's better than NVIDIA's accelerator paradigm that just blows them out of the water and this is the new best way to do training? Or is training going to become less important as the world moves towards inference? The models are good enough and now we're just using them in more clever ways on consumer devices. Got it. Okay, so that's a phenomenally good answer. It really helps me frame this in my brain. Yeah. In a Sorry again, it's so way. long. Yeah. It's, Dude, it's, no, there's it's, a lot of parts, right? Like Alex, I'm telling you, you are you have given me more knowledge in the last what is it, 23 minutes than I've been able to capture in the last 
freaking four months of trying to research the <laughs> <your> story. <laughs> sure. So I, I really appreciate what you're doing here. Okay. So if yeah. I'm going to use a Tesla analogy here, so one of the things that, um, you know, because I follow that that story super closely and I have been for, for quite a while. Yeah. I I think there's parallels to be drawn here where, you know, the, the Tesla story, if you look at like the people that are poo-pooing on the story, they're like, well, somebody's going to come in. They're just going to displace Tesla because it's just a, a car. And, you know, any, you know, these legacy automakers are going to be able to come out with an EV that's going to sell just as good as a Tesla and they have brand recognition, blah, blah, blah. But as time has gone on, you've seen that it's not just a put something on four wheels and make it go and just change the engine with the battery. It's it's an entirely different solution. It's completely different. And there's a reason why Tesla is the only one that can generate a profit is because they figured out how to combine the value proposition with their manufacturing expertise to get this thing to be something that people actually want and they can make money at it. And that's why they're they're a viable business. Right. And then we can talk about FSA and all that other stuff. Right. So now with NVIDIA, what I'm hearing is that it sounds like they have a similar type of lead or moat versus everybody else where they figured out how to create a value proposition for, I'm going to call it AI compute that is leagues above uh, uh, and ahead of everyone else. And that's why they can go into a data center, take up a fraction or a percentage less than everybody else uh, in that footprint for that data center. And in that same footprint, they can deliver better value for for money, for computer, whatever else, right? So, so I guess my question is, what would a competitor have to do in order to match Nvidia in that case? Like, what 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 does? Can you give me like a simplified or or, or a detailed sure. sort of rundown through? Okay, if competitor B, if Bvidia, if Bvidia yeah. is like, oh, we're gonna kill Nvidia. What what does that look like? Um, it probably looks like a fundamentally different kind of chip. So it's not a G. No one's catching. NVIDIA in the GPU game any more than they're catching Tesla in the EV game, right? Like, you know, they're leaps and bounds ahead. They've extended their lead over time. They move fast. They have everything going on in that respect. So, And if I can interrupt you there, so, sure. so why? Why in that specific space? Why have they been able to do that? Is it like an architecture thing? Is it a talent thing? Is it a culture thing? It's, like, it's, it's kind of all three, right? So you got to remember that AMD and Intel, which I assume are the competitors you have in your mind, right? Like when I think of who can displace Intel and, or excuse me, NVIDIA today, it's got to be someone who's not their own cloud service provider because they want to work with multiple cloud service providers. So now you're limited to like third-party chip companies, which means you're talking about sort of the Qualcomm's, the um, AMD's, the Intel's of the world, right? Qualcomm, mostly in edge computing today, as far as I know. So we're really talking about AMD and Intel. So let's back up and just talk about what those companies do at a high level. AMD and Intel make what are called CPUs, fundamentally different from GPUs. Their x86, which is like a type of architecture, you know, um, or ARM, which is the competing architecture to x86. CPUs, pro, they do tasks in serial, and they're really good at that. They're, they tend to be the reason they're central processing units is they really tend to be the brain, right? They'll coordinate other things for other chips, memory, all these other things. What they don't do is compute in parallel. And it turns out that parallel computing is the right kind of framework for AI problems. AI problems look a lot like graphics problems mathematically. That is why GPUs have won the AI war over CPUs. They're just much better chips for the same amount of power and size to crunch through the parallel networks, you know, whether they're neural networks or whatever, right? That's really a GPU game today. Intel's core product, CPUs for sure. AMD's core product, I would argue, still CPUs. You know, if you look at their data center revenue, it's going to mostly be Epic chips not really their instinct platform yet, right? Why am I saying that? Because NVIDIA has only made GPUs from the very beginning. They, like, they've made CPUs from time to time. They've, like, helped power Microsoft devices back in the day, if I remember right. But, like, fundamentally, they are a company that made GPUs 30 years ago and have ran with that till today. So that's in their DNA. They didn't start with CPUs and migrate, which is what their competitors have done, right? Once Got they realize it. that importance. And so like, it's like, 
and if and if it was easy, if it was quote unquote easy enough for Intel and AMD to switch over to GPUs, you know, they you think they have the res, you know, they have a bunch of money, they got talent, they got the footprint, they got manufacturing expertise. And, and so it's almost like for the last 30 years, the fact that they haven't been able to compete with NVIDIA is sort of like a like a proof that it's not just like, a, hey, we're just going to start making this kind of chip. There's a lot of innovation and a lot of things that that go on in creating a, say, a GPU versus a CPU versus whatever else that that is a fundamental that, that is fundamentally different from what that player has been 100%. doing for as long. Okay, perfect. So 100%. that helps a ton. Thank you. And let's let's um, so let's reframe it as like a Tesla example, right? Yeah. Tesla started as an electric vehicle company, right? So yes. why is it that Tesla can beat GM when GM has so many more factories, so many more employees, such a much bigger network of vendors? Like what is going on there, right? And the answer is, well, it's actually really hard to cannibalize your own business with this completely different product, mm. right? Like that's, you know, I, I've been making CPUs for the last 30 years. I had no idea GPUs were going to be that big. Like I knew they were important for graphics and some parallel compute stuff, but fundamentally data centers need CPUs and GPUs. That was the world in 2017, 2018, right? Like and then all of a sudden GPUs grew in importance. So AMD and Intel were like, crap, we got to make better data center GPUs. And they caught it early, but they caught it very late compared to NVIDIA. Who's been like, hey, we already make that. We're just going to, now we just know to accelerate that timeline. And that's kind of what happened is they pushed the gas on their data center GPUs as soon as they saw the writing on the wall for large language models, the chat GPT moment, so to speak, where everyone else is like, oh, we have to cannibalize some resources to get into that game. And NVIDIA is just like, hey, we've been in this game the whole time, right? So super helpful. Thank yeah. you. Hans, go. For so let's add on to that. You know, one of the things is I've done this a little bit more of a deep dive and I'm I'm nowhere near the level that I need to be or want to be on understanding Nvidia as a company or especially Jensen as a CEO. Sure. Um but it seems to me that Jensen has had the type of foresight and is trying to solve problems at the scale that Elon was trying to solve them. You know that's that's one of the the crazy things about Elon. We'll say let's go back to 2013. And he's saying, hey, we need to build the world's biggest battery factory. We need to build a battery factory that's so big that yeah. it's as much battery capacity as the entire world uses today. And the reason is because that is a small fraction of the batteries that we need in order to convert the world to sustainable energy future. And so, you know, you've got that goal of I want to create a market that is able to satisfy, you know, that demand. And I'm going to create a like we're going to create a product that creates a market that drives the structural shift in the shape of the world. And like yeah. that is that's the level that Elon's thinking on. It seems to me that Jensen is kind of operating in a similar way in the accelerated computer space that he's made a lot of big, large bets. He's been trying to create markets and not only create markets, but, you know, a little bit to touch on the the software side of things as well you know getting into things like omniverse getting into the forecast net like they've already while other people are just trying to finally create a gpu that competes with an nvidia gpu while nvidia is already you know further ahead and moving faster yeah than their competitors Jensen is already like, that's the foundation. Like they've already got that foundation in place. It's already better, faster, accelerating more quickly. People are having a hard time catching up with that. He's already building new layers on top of that stack. That's right. And, you know, building like their EOS super computer. Not only do they make these clusters, but they are their own customers. They have their own data center that is, you know, comparable to an AWS or a Microsoft Azure or a Google Cloud, and they're using that for their own use cases internally, and then trying to create, you know, the infrastructure for other people to come and operate those types of businesses. So they understand the the full stack of not only how do we make great GPUs, we're, we're doing the things that you then use GPUs for, yeah, so that we can get our minds in the customers' heads of how do we optimize the way this thing is going to be used. And um, 
I, I just was wondering if you have any commentary on that dynamic and, and how you see that playing out more and more, you know, especially the commentary that Jensen has made about, we want to become the AI foundry for the world that we want to be for the software services business, what TSMC has been yeah. for the chip business. Yeah, I, I honestly think you nailed it. I think that's a great view into like why NVIDIA is set up the way it is, you know, why they're approaching software and hardware the way they do, where their vertical integration is, why they care so much about things like adding in the Omniverse, you know, NVIDIA Drive is a piece of the Omniverse, why they do supercomputing for weather. Um, I think the one thing I can add that might be valuable to what you said, because you did such a great job is NVIDIA is really good at long-term thinking. Here's, here's what I mean by that. I, I was an academic for a long time and NVIDIA would have acceleration libraries for things that there is absolutely no market in, right? Like these things are not making NVIDIA money. They're doing it because they're legit just trying to help accelerate research. So going back to your, I think one of your earlier comments about Jensen trying to make markets, the way you make markets is by enabling a market to exist for a problem that like is fundamentally very hard to solve, but you know, multiple people have it. Cancer research, DNA sequencing. There's a market today now because in the beginning when it was really hard and really expensive to do that stuff, someone made a big bet that, hey, if we drive the cost down of these things, there will be new services and products that are built on top of them. And now there's 23andMe. You know, last year I got a DNA kit for my dog to know what breed it is, right? Like that would have been unimaginable 15 years ago when it was like, a billion dollars to sequence a genome or whatever. It's like, I paid 80 bucks for that kit and it was on sale. You know what I mean? Like, so my point is that same thing is going to be true everywhere in a few years, right? So the acceleration libraries that NVIDIA builds today for academics, for these esoteric problems that like, you know, seem like there's no way this will be a market. The reason there's no market for that today is because that research is expensive because it's not very well supported. So NVIDIA understands that a way to build a market is to start like developing these acceleration libraries, these capabilities, these use cases, and drive the help drive the cost down of that research, which will eventually lead to a market growing out of it. So, dude, this is like a mind blowing discussion. <laughs> it's funny. I'm how, glad. Like, yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, yeah. It's just so, so fun. It's just it's so funny how there is like these these uh, common shared traits between companies that are building now for 10 years from now yeah. versus companies that are building now for like yesterday. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, what what does the market, oh, this is where the markets go, this is where the profit's going right now, so we have to start building towards this, you know? Oh, like the, the, our customer is, is asking for this, we should probably start making this. And like, what what comes to mind is sort of like, you know, the car market, which, is, which I'm very familiar with, but like the NVIDIA story has so many parallels to to the Tesla story in that way, where it's like they're they're Jensen is like Jensen's in the future. He's like he's he's 10 to 20 years in the future. And he's like, what do I need to do now so that that 10 year thing that Jensen feels confident will be the thing comes to reality? And I feel like that's what has allowed Nvidia to come to this point. It's like yeah, you have these absolutely. you guys you have these guys with like crystal balls that somehow are right freaking every time. And then they, they have the resources to put in the work so that that crystal ball can't become right. And then it becomes right. Yeah. <laughs> like so there's, there's probably like two useful pieces of information in that, right? Like, first of all, I agree with everything you just said. What What's what's the big deal here? So Jensen, guys like uh, Jeff Bezos, right? The thing that they all have in common is they're really, they they have a crystal clear vision, but they're pretty loose in how it gets executed, Right. Let me give you a perfect example. Blackwell is a chip that should not exist, right? For for the amount of compute that it has, the world wasn't ready for it today. Meaning TSMC couldn't build a chip with that level of compute. So what did they do? They said, okay, that's fine. We'll make the chip twice as big, which means half the compute per unit area that we thought, and we will link the two together. So the B100 is actually two chips that get tricked into thinking they're the same one chip, right? Because it's physically impossible to build one chip with that amount of compute today. TSMC can't do it. And TSMC is kind of like the absolute bleeding edge of semiconductor fabrication, right? So NVIDIA kind of cheated physics. They said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll back off and we'll just use a link, 
a, a hyperspeed link to connect the two chips, right? That probably wasn't their initial vision is why I'm saying that. But that Blackwell chip is going to be in data centers, you know, in the next four, five, six quarters, let's say. And then I'm sure we'll see another version of it on a single die when fabrication capabilities catch up to that design, right? Same thing with Tesla, right? If I remember correctly, and I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering this, Tesla started by gluing cell phone batteries together to prove that that chemistry can work to power a car, right? Like that battery didn't exist. So it's like they had to physically prove like, hey, we're doing it the sloppy way. That's not obviously not the way we should do it. But what we're walking out with is a car that gets powered in a way that people said could not be done, right? 100%. The, the second laptop thing I want- Laptop batteries, Alex, come on now, laptop batteries. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, well, I, I knew, I was How like, I know you. this is a story, like, I'm gonna get wrong. So, you're but, good, you're good. totally, right? So the second thing I wanna say is sort of like a, let's take one step back, right? There's a great TED talk by a guy named Simon Sinek. It's called The Infinite Game. I think he actually wrote a book about it too, right? There's two types of companies in the world loosely, right? The first is the company playing the infinite game. They're looking into the future and they're saying, what does my customer need 10 years from now? What do supercomputers look like? What do we need to predict weather? What, you know, this, that, and the, what does cancer research look like? And they build for that. They're playing the infinite game. They're only competing with themselves in the future. The other kind of company is the kind of company playing the finite game. What they're doing is they're looking at the guy who's in the lead and they're saying, how do I catch up to him? What do I need to release to beat him? What, you know, that's what everyone is doing. That's not Tesla. They're looking at the Teslas and they go, how do we get our models that cheap or that far range or whatever? Tesla is just incrementally making better batteries, car bodies, AI, right? Like everyone else is looking that way. In my opinion, the same is true for Nvidia. Nvidia is deadlocked ahead. They're saying, what are all the problems we can solve in parallel computing? that aren't being solved by anyone else, and how do we solve them? And then people like AMD and Intel are going, how do we compete with the NVIDIA H100, which is the chip in most data centers today? There are two completely different paradigms that I think yield two very different results. And honestly, um, you know, even Tesla is in that category of finite players in comparison to NVIDIA on Dojo specifically. On Dojo, like, yeah, okay, know, yeah. Yeah, Tesla's playing its own infinite games and then it's saying, hey, we've got all these AI ambitions and you know we don't wanna be just at NVIDIA's mercy, let's let's make Dojo. And it seems like you know we, we haven't got a full update on how well the Dojo project is going. I think it is going well. I just don't think it's going well enough to keep pace with how fast NVIDIA is doing for sure. Um, to where they could rely 100% on Dojo. I think that they're going to just continue to buy from from all intents and purposes. It looks to me like they're just going to continue to buy NVIDIA hardware deep into the future because Jensen's able to deliver capabilities that, you know, Dojo can't sure. at this point in time. And that's one of the things that really, really opened my eyes to just how far ahead. I was like, if, if Jensen can outpace Elon and the Tesla team on Dojo, with respect to the the primary means of compute in the training cluster for FSD, that's you know that's incredibly special. That like how how does someone go head to head with Elon and come out on top? Because that almost never happens. Yeah, and and that was the thing that I was just like, okay, I really really need to understand how this is possible at a deeper level. And so I. I I'd flip that on you, right? So NVIDIA has been doing GPUs and this kind of stuff way longer than Tesla. And so Tesla did it for two very good reasons. So like, I just want to be clear, Dojo is not a failure in any way, just because it can't compete with it. I'm making air quotes. It can't compete with NVIDIA, right? Like um, they're designed to do two very different things. So Dojo, the necessity for Dojo is this, there's a chip supply shortage. And on top of the chip supply shortage, NVIDIA's chips specifically, you know, they they can't keep up with their own demand, right? So there's some supply chain insecurity around getting NVIDIA's chips. And some of that's been alleviated now, but Dojo got started way before now, right? So the first reason they built Dojo was because they didn't want to be stranded if they couldn't get NVIDIA's chips at all, right? Not just relying on them in terms of like a vendor supplying compute, but 
I'm dead in the water if I can't get this compute at all, if I can't secure my own H100s. So we better design our own chips just to have some measure of compute ability to train our model. The second thing is NVIDIA's GPUs do a lot more than train on video in, actions out, right? Or back when it was FSD, I'm going to butcher this, sorry, 11 and before when it was much more rules-based, right? It was NVIDIA's chips do much more than train from video, right? So the other good reason to build Dojo was to build a data center scale computing cluster focused exclusively on Tesla's problem. It's optimized for video in, let's call it answers out, depending on which version of FSD you're talking about. But now that is a different hardware solution than H100s. Is it better? Is it worse? Like, I, I'm not going to comment there, but the truth is it is a specialized AI problem and NVIDIA's chips are generalized AI chips. So there, there were two good reasons to build jo Dojo, even though neither of them are catching NVIDIA, right? Mm -hmm. Let me... Um... Of course, dude. Let me let me ask you a question on. Um, so okay, so I've heard I've heard this is like what you read on on you know on the news websites. Like you go to Google, you type Nvidia, you go to the news tab, and then a bunch of stuff comes out, right? Yeah. And this is as I've heard you talk, I, I can kind of start conceptualizing what this means. But the thing I sometimes read is like Nvidia is getting into self driving cars. Nvidia is getting into humanoid robots. Okay. Yeah. Help me help me contextualize that. I think I understand now what they're doing, but help me contextualize that. Okay, so yeah. So w let's back up and talk about generative AI in general, right? So these used to be, let's remove ourselves from chat GPT. Let's go back to the land before large language models existed. Robotics, self-driving cars, DNA sequencing, all these things used to be considered very separate problems right? Different specialists, different, you know, not bodies of knowledge, different hardware, like everything about them just fundamentally different. Artificial intelligence is a huge uh, body of science. It's like saying the word biology, right? It's like, the, well, there's tons of things from agriculture to DNA, like all this kind of stuff fit into that bucket. So there were different areas of artificial intelligence being applied to Netflix, to, you know, Google, to all these different places, right? Generative AI, this transformer architecture, started unifying a lot of different AI capabilities, right? The same kinds of math, not exactly the same math, but the same architecture that solves self-driving by giving you video in action out is useful for teaching robots like manipulator arms to do video in action out is the same kind of architecture that's useful on and on and on and on, right? Like some sort of information in, some sort of pattern is recognized, some sort of output based on that pattern is executed. This transformer architecture, and then, you know, there's also other types of models like diffusion models, which is more for images, right? So like stable diffusion, mid journey, those kind of things. So like all of a sudden in, in just a couple different paradigms, you're solving a lot more problems. And they all happen to be AI problems that work well on NVIDIA's hardware. So it's not that NVIDIA got into self-driving cars. It's NVIDIA's AI solution is being applied to self-driving cars, right? Like it's being applied to medicine. It's being applied to on and on and on. Like the world is kind of coming together and saying, hey, this generative AI thing is a great way to solving parts and problems in many different fields. And so NVIDIA ends up in being in most of them. So they build like specialized acceleration libraries, optimization packages, things for their GPUs that are like, oh, DNA sequencing looks more like this. This is the package you want to install to do that so that we're not like rendering graphics for you when you are trying to do this like very different type of math for protein folding or whatever. I'm making that up, obviously, but that's like the idea, right? Yeah, got it. Okay. Yeah, that's and so hearing you speak, that's that's exactly where my brain went. And yeah, so that's yeah. that's. That's perfect. Okay. So what's what's super interesting about that, and, and you alluded to this just now, I think, is that if you fast forward 10 years, what what wouldn't be encapsulated by this? If you're thinking about like, you know, f from a physical, like the physical world perspective, let's start there, right? Information in, actions out. Okay. If NVIDIA is positioned as the player that has the best solution to provide you the hardware 
for like, let's again, use the Tesla example for Tesla to come and then write what Hans has coined its meat space GPT on top of that hardware to actually create the actions. And then let's say the same company, Tesla, then creates the manufacturing system so that the meat space GPT powered by NVIDIA actions are fed into the machine to go like, make right turn, stop at light, whatever. And all of yeah. these are AI based. So what in the physical world won't have this in the future? Like th this is where I'm like, like I'm trying to conceptualize maximum NVIDIA. And to me, it seems like it's, I don't want to call it infinite, but it seems like they're going to be pretty freaking big. So help me, help me understand that. <laughs> you're, you're, you're describing my investment thesis in NVIDIA, right? Like you're, that's, yep. <laughs> um, I, I do. So <laughs> thank everybody. See you tomorrow. Yeah, that's it. See ya. Like, um, I, I think it's, so here's, here's like the real answer, right? I do think there are places where this is more applicable and places where this is less applicable. There's definitely regulated industries where you're not just going to trust generative AI to spit out an answer and do things. You're going to want humans in the loop. You know, you can imagine the defense industry can and should be very hesitant to adopt generative AI technology, spacefaring or surgery or anywhere where, you know, the failure rate has to be like literally zero because the failure state is catastrophic. A rocket blows up, a surgeon, you know, surgeon robot slips up and kills someone. Self-driving is actually a pretty good example of that because if a robot causes an accident, so on and so forth, where the stakes are high, I think there's going to be much more specialized computing architectures, probably even from the chips up to assure that there's, you know, a 0 000, 000, 100 more zeros, 1% state of failure because failure is so catastrophic. Um, for everywhere else where you can tolerate 1, 2, 5% failure rates, which is actually pretty high. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can already do today, right? Like chat GPT, if you're willing to accept one out of every 10 or 20 answers is a hallucination, like it's there already, right? So it's like, you can get a lot of bang for your buck there. There are plenty of aerospace. You would never accept that. You would never walk onto a plane where, Hey, 5% chance this thing's not landing. You'd be like, get me off the plane. Right? So, um, I think, I think it's really more about that versus where does this not apply? It's like, where is it not good enough? You know? Okay, so that that that's very helpful. But even in like let's say the 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 self driving uh, space, even though it's going to be more specialized, Nvidia still has a gigantic TAM to work in yeah. because their solution is so much better than everybody else's, right? So even in the specialized areas, there they have a market to sell into. Yeah, and, and I think that really comes down to just like you know when you think about level two, level three autonomy, and like what's what is regulated to be needed in autonomy, sensor redundancy. I know Tesla, like the Tesla community is like, hey, this problem is solvable with vision only. So why do regulations not permit you to solve it with vision only? V that's a very fair argument. You know, I I'm not commenting on how things should be. I'm just commenting on how things currently are. NVIDIA's solution, I believe it's, you know, the NVIDIA drive platform, the Hyperion 9 hardware platform, right? Like, so, the idea for NVIDIA is for all of these car manufacturers, which are not AI companies, but may want a self-driving car or a car that has, you know, level one or level two autonomy, you know, some automated features, parking assist, find my, like come to me, chauffeur mode, lane keeping and all that kind of stuff. They don't have to have like an internal AI department to build that anymore. They can just buy and integrate NVIDIA's platform. And now all of a sudden, you have a car that can reach some level of autonomy, right? Uh, you know, Mercedes Benz, you know, is infamously right now at level three, while Tesla is level two. We can comment on should that be the case, but right now, you know, that seems to be the case in the market, right? They're selling a level three vehicle. It's built on NVIDIA's platform. That's their drive pilot. Mercedes drive pilot is powered by NVIDIA's drive platform. Does yeah, it, sorry, no, does that answer your question or did I totally it does. Like, no, it, yeah. no, it does, it does. Um, <laughs> the Mercedes ones is funny because it's it's le it's totally level three, but like oh, the, the yeah. it, it but it's like on specific highways the address, the less in California, yeah, yeah, in California, only sunny, only I uh, totally <laughs> get it. I totally yeah, am on yeah. the same page. But they yeah. figured it out. But but they have but they have a solution that says, hey, if, if we do 
say, driver, do not pay attention during these very constrained moments. They are willing, to, Mercedes or, yeah, I guess Mercedes in that, at, at, that, at that point would be willing to take on the responsibility if something were to go wrong. Exactly. And it's powered by NVIDIA. And so and that's, also, that's a pretty big, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, sorry. No, please. Please, please. Um, they're also like, so I think the regulation framework is definitely unfair to Elon, right? Like there's no doubt that regulators are sort of doing everything they can to make Elon's life harder. But the regulatory environment for self-driving cars has certain stipulations. What is level two? What is level three? And I think what NVIDIA is doing, because they have to deal with regulations so much already with China and you know, sanctions and like all these things on their chips, is they're saying, look, this is the framework for if we want our systems to be approved for level three, one day level four, one day in the far future level five, right? This is the framework. We're going to operate inside that framework. Whether Elon chooses to do that, by which I mean specifically sensor redundancy, right? Cert, you know, all these stipulations that are involved today, you know, sort of remains to be seen. Do I think Tesla will hit level five autonomy in spirit? Absolutely. Will they? Uh, the question is, will they actually hit level five according to the letter of the law that the regular the regulators are stipulating today, right? Sensor, like all these things that go into that, right? That's my question. I don't have the answer. And I'm not saying no. I'm just saying that's the difference between what should be and what is, right? Like For sure. Yeah, 100%. And I think, I think what's, and this is kind of like an encapsulation of, I feel like why the AI space is so interesting to me. It's because it's able to offer solutions that are so game changing in nature that it sort of ha forces us to, it, you know, for the ones that are willing to question, it forces people to question, does this even make sense in the world where you have a system that's going to perform far beyond what we could do in that space, yet the rules are artificially keeping that thing from becoming reality oh. because we're trying to judge it as a human versus a, a versus a machine. But I, yeah. I still think that the bait is super helpful and it, and it should be had because it, if we're going to offload trust onto a machine, we better be sure, <laughs> you know, we better be sure. So from that perspective, I'm happy that that type of discourse is, is going on because I, I think it's going to allow all the fears and all the, uh, all the legitimate criticisms and everything to come to the surface. And then those can get addressed one by one by one by one, be it through uh, re hardware redundancy or be it through data that proves that uh, the the current uh, hardware suite is you know ten to hundred x safer than a human or whatever that is, and then working with regulators to create a framework that doesn't prevent a life changing technology from coming to the roads too late because it already is helpful enough, right? And it, it, this yeah. whole discussion is becomes really interesting. Yeah, I one hundred percent agree with that. And I I you know regardless of which camp you're in as an investor. I definitely agree with everything you just said, where the discussion of how the like humanity can and should solve these problems and what the job of regulators is and isn't it, like in guiding that, I completely agree is a healthy debate we should be having on many subjects, not just self-driving. Agreed. Yeah. And I just want to clarify for you know the audience, the, the bet that Elon is making is really around that trust piece that right now the regular regulators are saying that in order to trust a system to be able to provide xyz results it needs to have these extra sensors and all all these like the way that it needs to be built has to conform to these things because if it doesn't have those things we won't trust it uh, to achieve the results and what elon is saying is i'm throwing out what you think the solution has to be you know kind of like you were saying earlier where he he knows that self-driving is possible and he's flexible in how it gets achieved. And he's like, well, if the way to achieve it doesn't conform with the results, then we'll achieve it. We'll build up the data that proves that it provides the results. And then we'll come to Mr. Regulator and say, hey, all of your requirements are invalid. And it operates over here in these jurisdictions that don't have these things. And you know the data is unassailable. It says that it's way safer. So you over here, other Mr. Regulator are costing the lives of your citizens currently because you have put in place stupid regulations that, you know, don't adhere to reality. Yeah, I, I, I think I even agree with that. In my personal opinion, regulators should be regulating outcomes. Hey, you have to be at least this safe 
before we let you drive autonomously. They should not be guiding how those outcomes are achieved, right? Not in self-driving, not in water cleanliness, not in whatever, right? But it's like, here is what we need you to do at a minimum to meet this, you know, certification, how you do it, as long as it's safe and adheres to these loose guidelines or whatever, you know, other than that, we're looking for the data to justify the safety rating, right? Like, so I, I personally agree with that. I think we're falling back into the camp of what should be versus what is. That's my opinion. Oh yeah, a hundred percent agree. I, and I think what's, yeah, it's just so fascinating. I just love when there are companies that are just willing to push the boundaries when it comes to this kind of stuff, like, like solving for the should be state. I feel like eventually ends like leads you to the, to the, to that state. And it, again, it goes back to what you said earlier, Alex is like, you're flexible and Hans just repeated it. You're flexible in, in how you're arriving to the solution, but the should be state, and it's almost like linked to it, you know, thinking about it from a first principles perspective is what leads those companies over time, I believe, to reach those states. Because then let's say there is additional hardware that's needed. You need extra cameras and all the angles. You need, uh, I don't know, two computers. You need whatever. You need uh, uh, cameras up front. Okay, cool. So just, you know, you already have the framework set up with uh, AI, you know, with, with NVIDIA. NVIDIA power chips with your meat space GPT, just throw it to the AI, super simplification here, but throw it to the AI, let it figure it out and then go. It might take a couple more years, whatever it is, but at least you've built the framework that allows you to reach that end state. And I think that's, that's what's most interesting about the sort of the Tesla story. Let me pick your brain a little bit on that. If you don't mind, do you have, do you have time, Alex, for a little bit more? I have all the time in the world. I cleared my calendar. I appreciate you so much. That's so great. Um, so just give me an idea how, so how are you viewing the Tesla story? We don't have to have a have to talk about stock necessarily, but like how how are you viewing the Tesla story? How do you see it playing out in the in the next few years? Just to kind of get an idea of how how you're viewing everything that's going on. Yeah, I, like I definitely have the unpopular opinion on Tesla right now. So I, I'm generally bullish on Tesla in general. That's like my my blanket statement. My worry lately, let's say for the last like maybe 12, 18 months or so, twofold. One, I think Elon is much more distracted than people are, you know, letting on or whatever. I think the Twitter acquisition was really, you know, a big bruise to his brand and something that spreads him way thinner than he needs to be. And I'm not saying that like out of any social stance or political stance. What I mean is if you look at his other companies, the boring company, Neuralink, SpaceX, Tesla, SolarCity back when that was a thing, right? Like, these are hard engineering problems in the hardware space. These are companies that are industrial heavy. They're doing something very challenging in the physical world, embedding chips in brains, landing rockets backwards, right? Self-driving cars on and on and on building, you know, boring holes under entire cities, etc. Twitter doesn't really look like that. So he's being pulled in a different direction from the rest of his portfolio of incredible hardware companies. So that's one thing. And and this is a discussion. I'm just giving you my opinion, right? Um, The other thing that scares me more recently is for a while, FSD was rules-based, right? And they were far ahead, like they had these AI days and they clearly explained, hey, here's how we're doing things and we're solving this challenging problem. Version 12, it performs way better, but it is a fundamental redesign of all of FSD, right? It's a, it's a, for lack of a better word, it's saying, hey, the way we have spent years and years trying to solve this problem isn't going to work or isn't going to work well enough that we want to make the switch to this pixels in action out model, which is, in my opinion, has a much shallower moat than their old way, because now it's like, well, that's what everyone else is doing. Robots are going to learn that way, right? Like NVIDIA has these sort of like learn by imitation solutions, blah, blah, blah. Like they've they've given up a lot of their secret sauce by switching to something that is the hot new way of solving these control systems models. So those are my two biggest worries with Tesla, Elon being spread thin, and now their current solution for self-driving looking a lot less unique um, in the near term. No, I so I really appreciate that. Um, I saw you come off mute, Hans. Did you want to go first or do you want me to go first? You can go first. 
Okay. Yeah. I think I think what's interesting with uh, with the uh, with the Twitter. So I I'll, I'll hit the Twitter thing and then I hit the FSD thing. So from my perspective, the Twitter thing is definitely uh, it's a weird one <laughs> because you're you're putting he's putting himself in a situation that's obviously completely out of his uh, comfort zone. He's had more foot and mouth moments in the last twelve to eighteen months than he has in the in the past 20 years combined times a (laughs) hundred. Right. So it's like this. Yeah. (laughs) Hans is like, no, (laughs) he's had pedo guy was way before that was bad. Yeah. Smoking pot on Joe Rogan. That was bad. Tesla's going bankrupt. That was bad. Yeah. But, but there's definitely like, you know, but, but he has what, what's interesting about the acquisition is that he has openly said in the past that he wanted to reduce attack vectors on himself, you know, like he was on Rogan. I remember talking about, you know, there's always these attack vectors on me and that's why he sold his home. So that's why he claimed he sold his homes. And he's like, well, I'm trying to reduce attack vectors on me because, you know, it's it's distracting and I'm trying to focus on the thing. And then he does this acquisition with Twitter, which is almost like inviting the attack vectors. Right. Yeah. So it's like completely opposite. I think the the way I view it. And so when I view it through this lens, you know, some people call me stupid. It, but I just I try to be uh, as objective as I can be. I think when Elon identifies the uh, from his viewpoint an existential threat to humanity or something that is existential to humanity, uh, I feel like he feels responsible to at least make an effort to make something happen if it's within his area of expertise. And so SpaceX, I think, can be justified in that way, which is given in, uh, humanity and insurance policy. Tesla can be justified in that way, which is to accelerate the world to a sustainable future so we don't you know, cause climate change in the long term and end up all dying. Neuralink is trying to ensure that we have a good outcome with AI in the future so that we're not sort of servants to the AI, that we can come together with AI and allow us to have, you know, proper communication with each other. Uh, Neuralink lets so it's just make tunnels so that traffic doesn't kill you. I mean, kind of, I guess kind of, you know, people hate traffic. Oh, boring, yeah, boring <laughs> yeah, boring company. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so from that lens, I think it I think it makes sense. It's just the context of it is weird because he's putting himself, uh, you know, in a direct sort of firing line uh, of people, either through politics or through opinions or emotions, where I do think for a segment of the population, a subset of the population, I think his brand has totally taken a hit. I, I agree 100 yeah. percent with that. I think on the flip side, what's interesting is that it's also opened the door to uh, a large swath of the population that I don't think would have ever taken him seriously that are now like are saying, oh, free speech. Yeah, let's go. So like the people that he sort of brought to himself around uh, like the climate change movement that he's now turned off <laughs> quite a bit. Now he's like sort of saying, I don't know if he's doing this on purpose, but like the way I viewed the sort of thing is like those people are like now sidelined, unfortunately. But now you have this large swath of like free speech people that are like, hell yeah, free speech that would have never in a thousand years paid attention to his story because they're like, oh, look at this climate change guy. So like that's what's interesting to me. It's like he's definitely given up brand on one side, but I think he's gaining, gaining brand on another side. Um, but but I think net net uh, in the long term, I'm curious to see if this becomes a win for him, because if he is able to leverage his uh, technical expertise to make a, an actual killer app that does generate a bunch of revenue and profits, and it's something that a lot of people use and find useful, then I think long term becomes a win. But it we still have to see. Um, I, did you want to I don't know if you want to throw anything on there before I hit the Tesla thing. Yeah. Uh, sorry, so Alex, I, I, yeah. I actually have a lot to say. That I, Hans, did you want to like? Oh yeah. Is there a? Oh, I guess I could add right here the one extra dimension of you know, I a hundred percent agree that like you said, his brand has taken a hit in a number of ways, and that when you look at the surface level of all the hardware things that this you know this social network software thing doesn't seem to fit. Uh, I would say. To that, though, don't forget, this is the guy who was one of the co-founders of PayPal and that oh. this software thing was kind of where he started. And this is a return to that. But more so, I think the the grand unifying plan that brings a lot of what he's doing together that people a lot of times forget about because it's so nuts is a self-sustaining colony on Mars. And that there is an important piece that a social networking technology plays in having a sustainable colony, you know, on another planet. 
whether that's from governance, whether that's infrastructure, I think a lot of, you know, the, the monetary, the payment system, like how people actually are able to engage in commerce, um, that some of those things that we have as yet to really see get built into X, but Elon has spoken about wanting to bring to X specifically, um, that those are things that fit into Elon's, you know, 10, 20, 100, thousand year plan of what he's building that do make sense um to him specifically that you know other people aren't necessarily seeing at this point in time yeah yeah like so i i respect that opinion a lot i i personally don't agree with it um i think there's a lot of evidence pointing to for example when he was trying to make the acquisition not go through when he was trying to back out of it due to bots due, like we can talk about the validity of that but you know, there were plenty of reasons and times where he was very clear he didn't want to acquire Twitter, right? Like, and then he was forced to make that acquisition. And the counter argument I will make, or at least the counterpoint I'll provide is, you know, he's really good in the hardware space, right? So Mars is going to need energy, for example. So, and we have an energy, you know, crunch here on earth, especially with all this AI compute going up. So wouldn't it have made more sense, for example, for him to say, hey, you know what? We're going to start making solutions to energize people's homes, not just grab energy from the sun, but you know whether that's like tiny fission reactors or whatever, I'm making up the solution. But hey, we have that need on Earth because HVAC and all these things are huge power consumptions. We have that need on the compute side. So I'll build them just like the power wall for consumers, for data centers, and then in a way that goes on Mars. So now we have a power providing solution in addition to a boring solution, in addition to a you know, Starlink internet solution in addition to a transport solution and blah, 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 blah. So like there are plenty of challenges that Elon can be solving that are firmly within his wheelhouse, energy being one of them, that are existential crises to humanity today that aren't Twitter, right? Like, so that's my opinion is like, he seems more spread thin. He seems more unpredictable. I actually don't care about his brand. I really respect him for, as an engineer, I, I think he's done marvels for the world already for all the things you guys have said i just don't see twitter falling into that like same bucket you know and i think there are other problems he could have solved with his talents much faster you know manufacturing in space there's another one it's like build the first gigafactory in space because there are plenty of materials and things that really suffer when they're built in gravity i don't know a single person better than elon musk to be building that kind of stuff right like Twitter, yeah, I mean, I can probably point to 100 people who are more qualified than him. Not because he's a, it's just out of his domain, right? I don't mean any disrespect. It's Twitter and landing rockets backwards on barges are two different problem sets, in my opinion. Yeah, Twitter's harder. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me, yeah. Like, he hasn't fully wrapped his head around that one, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so let me... Uh that's actually super, and I, I greatly appreciate your 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 opinion here. I really do, uh, and your insight. The one one of the th comments you made around the test of the second point was that the 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 um, approach they're taking to solve for self driving with twelve, which is fundamentally different than eleven, could yeah. could have given up their their quote unquote moat they had on self driving because it's trending towards where everyone else is going, right? Yeah, and I'm I'm wondering if. And this sort of loosely tied to Twitter as well, in a way, is wouldn't the real moat be the data and the search engine for that data, which is their fleet of cars, which is going to allow them to have that long term moat uh, in the long term. And it's less about the approach, but more about the data that feeds the approach. And in a sort of loose way, if we view Twitter through that lens, which uh, if it continues to grow and, and it's continue goes to go through its path and sort of Elon has articulated this in the past and I'd love to hear your opinion on this. You know, this becomes a single source of data around humans sort of like what they're talking about, what they're saying, you know, uh, it kind of becomes a model for humanity. Couldn't that also be a moat from a data perspective that's going to feed his AI, AI ambitions? Help me help me understand how you're viewing that. No, I think those are two very, very great points. So like, I'm sure somebody inside Tesla, I'm sure lots of people got together and did the math and said, hey, look, we're really far ahead in these capabilities in these certain areas. If we give up our advantage in full self-driving, what we really gain is we're progressing more towards our actual goal of self-driving. Yes, now it looks more like everyone else, but I'm sure they said exactly what you just said. Hey, our power is we have the data to train this new model where everyone else is either simulating it or faking it or, you, you know, with geofencing, I mean by faking it or, um, 
you know, that or doing it in low quantities. And so they're not going to grab the edge cases, which means they're not going to do as good of a job than us. I'm sure that's exactly the calculus they did before they were like, throw FSD 11 out. We're going to do it this way because we know we can run with it because of our data advantage. So that's a great point. Twitter, I think, is a little different. So Twitter is people writing on the internet, right? And they're writing in all different forms. It's unstructured data and it is the human collective. Google has YouTube and search engines, right? Like, so there's another form of that sort of unstructured multimodal data. Facebook has everything everyone's ever posted on Facebook. Twitter looks a lot like old Facebook statuses. Yeah, I'm, there are plenty of reasons they're not the same, but what I, I guess what I'm saying there is, yes, Elon has access to that data now, but he's certainly not the only mega company with access to huma what humanity is thinking about at the time again, you know, YouTube, Facebook and so on. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a great point. Uh, another, another angle for the Twitter. Cause I think, I think what you've articulated is so like, I think, I think hits, hits it on, on the head, which is like, this seems so different from everything else he's done. And yeah. so what, one of the things that I, that I try to give him the benefit of the doubt for, um, and I could be doing this incorrectly, but it's like, there's gotta be a reason, bro. Like, this is so like, out of life. <laughs> there's, there's, come on. Like, it was this really that like crazy impulse. I'm just going to throw $44 billion and it could be, listen, the guy's like, he's, he's somewhere else. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's in a different plane. Almost. For sure. Yeah. Which both in a good way and a bad way sometimes. Yeah. But I wonder like how much of the play is getting enough people because, you know, he's talked about the fa the finance aspect of Twitter and how he wants to turn it into sort of a, a financial hub for for people. I yeah, wonder if that's app, the, right? the super app. Yeah. But even just having wallets available for everybody to be able to transfer uh, funds from one person to another. I wonder if he's just, that's really his and maybe maybe it's not the AI play, but it's like I'm just going to I'm just going to for 44 billion bucks. I'm going to buy 150 million wallets. And I'm gonna make a transaction fee every time somebody exchanges funds. I don't know, and and that's that's another you know thing that I'm thinking through to to see if this Twitter thing actually is gonna pan out the way he thinks. But yeah, totally. I don't know. And I like I would love an American super app. I forget it's called. I believe it's WeChat, WeChat. right? Like yeah. WeChat is so like for sure. If he turns into that, that's incredible. I would be on it for sure. Like I'm on Twitter now, but I mean I would use it for all those additional capabilities. I totally support the super app vision. And yeah, I think Elon would be great at that, right? But that is still fundamentally different. And it, you know, what could he, the real question is, what was the opportunity cost, right? Super app is great. I'm sure it's going to make loads of money. And I'm, it is an important thing for humanity to have in general. And it's great to have an American one specifically, right? But what could he have solved if he didn't have Twitter and he took that brain power and that $44 billion and applied it to, I'm just going to go back to the energy example, but to energy, to like a physical energy solution, right? Um, to a defense solution, to a, you know, you can imagine going back to the self-sustaining colony on Mars idea. I'm sure there are tens and tens of other really important problems that are going to be really hard to solve in the physical space, right? Not the digital commerce and com communication space. What if you solved one of those, you know, like water desalination, you know, I'm, I'm making it up, but he, that brain is probably way better suited to problems that look like rockets landing backwards and cars driving themselves is my honest guess. And the other, the only other thing I'll say on that is a, a fancy word for, you know, what you were saying before is there's gotta be a reason is there should be a reason. And I, I'm always careful to not invest in shoulds. Like, you know, I, I, Elon has my emotional and spiritual support but that's why he doesn't have all my dollars, right? Like, because I don't, I don't invest in shoulds. I invest in wills. Love that. Yeah. So I'll provide, you know, a counterpoint on, on perspective on, on that opportunity cost. And I would highly recommend anyone who hasn't to read the two books that Matt Ridley has written on innovation. So one of them is The Rational Optimist. It's kind of a foundation for this set of ideas. And then how innovation works is uh, really, really insightful. But the, the general overarching point that Matt Ridley makes in those is that advanced technologies are the product of a, a certain density of human social interactions and the capacity for the humans in that system to be free. So like the more people that can have, if, if you can cohere or like 
put a bunch of people into a space and give them the maximum amount of freedom, that is the thing that then kind of inevitably creates more and more advanced technology over time. And that if either you turn down the knob on freedom to where people are not allowed to do the thing that makes the most sense to them in their context, or so that would be, you know, introducing communism into a society. That's one, one vector. The other thing is if you just turn down the knob on population density, there's not enough people anymore that either sure. one of those two dials, if you turn them down, your, your society actually regresses technologically that it takes a certain density of this combination of freedom and num, you know, numerical, uh, density of people in order to sustain something like, like TSMC right now today, like this is basically a pinnacle of human technological achievement that this one yeah. company can exist in. Like if our global supply chain breaks down, if their customer, you know, if there's enough, uh, geopolitical instability that now we don't have the trade relationships that we have TSMC as a company can cease to exist. And if we lose TSMC, like think about all of the other technologies that depend on TSMC, like go away. You yeah. know, this is one of the risks that you have to reckon with as an investor in NVIDIA is, you know, so goes TSMC and totally. so goes the rest of the totally. technology sector. And so I think that, you know, this is a risk that Elon has talked about being forefront in his mind and that, you know, the trends that he's seeing in political discourse really are trending towards to both things that, you know, we need to have less people and that puts technology at risk. And, oh, we also need to have less freedom for general people to speak their minds, to do battle on ideas or just to be able to make their own choices with their dollars on, you know, what makes the most sense to them to get value from. And that Twitter is kind of his hat in the ring to try and maximize freedom of speech, freedom of expression for individuals and to put forth the idea that, Hey, we need more people. We don't need less people. Like our climate problems don't get solved unless we have more people, more prosperity, and we sure. throw more resources at solving solving the cri climate crisis, not try to you know pull back and be regressionary in our in our solutions. Um, so yeah, that's that's where I see his motivation for what he's doing, uh, both on Twitter, but you know just kind of in general, and why he thinks that that is a very very important piece of the puzzle that has to be solved in order to ensure like maximum possible beneficial future for humanity. Sure. Yeah, sure. I, I, you know, that sounds really nice. And I'm sure Elon has even said that, like, you know, very specifically, right. He cares about these things. I guess I, I, where I struggle is I don't know what to do with that now. Right. It's like, how do I, what, what do I even believe that same thing myself that it's those two things, just those two knobs. Is there a third knob? If those are the right two knobs, is Elon the right person to control those knobs? Is Twitter the right platform to save those knobs? Is there something else that's just going to come along? Like there's all these other variables and it's like such a qualitative uh, discussion, which is, it's a good discussion. I'm not saying that it's not worth having. I'm just saying like, you can quantify the number of SpaceX launches. You can qualify the number, quantify the number of Starlink satellites, number of Teslas on the road. I'm not sure how to quantify anything that we, we are talking about now or what to do with it once I quantify it, or how I judge the qualitative is, again, is Elon the right guy to be spearheading that versus the energy thing, right? Like, so there's just so many fuzzy variables and fuzzy frameworks around like, okay, I really hear what you said, I really do. And I just have no idea what to do with it. So that makes me want to take a step back and like, be like, okay, that's just not my area to, I can't waste compute cycles here because my meat computer only goes like a couple times a second anyway, right? Like. I need to focus on things I can actually like not cross my eyes about. So, yeah, I love that. It's the undoubtedly the amount of gray with that acquisition is insane. It, it's that's crazy. exactly my point. That's yeah. well said. Like the everything else has been very black and white. Elon Musk is the capabilities of his other either acquisitions or his, you know, the things that he's founded very clear, right? 
And to me, Twitter is the one that just stands out as the most gray. That's an excellent way of putting it. And yeah. I, I'm a simple man and I just don't like gray, you know, like, so. <laughs> and that's why the three of us have a YouTube channel and he's out there making rockets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. for sure. He's, he's able to operate yeah. with an uncertainty. That's just insane. It's astronomical. So, and it doesn't guarantee success either. That's, that's the, that's the, that's what's the, the spooky thing about it is that, you know, as, as brilliant as, as an individual could be, humans are humans and humans are, are, uh, very much capable of making some pretty catastrophic mistakes. And sometimes the ones that have the highest capability and the highest uh, ability to make change are end up being the ones that end up making the the biggest mistakes, Yeah, you know, because because they're able to do that. So it, it's such a it's just a fascinating time to, to to like watch sort of this arc transition, because it's like, you know, we're we're seeing this incredible world of technology, just like especially with the AI in the AI age, it's just exploding. And it, it completely yeah. came out of nowhere. I mean, like the fact that we're even able to sit down and talk about the real implications of what a technology felt like, it, it like it felt super abstract and it's still esoteric to even me to this day. I mean, it will be for a really long time because I'm just not that bright, but it's like, but it's real. Like we can sit down and like we can sit down and feel it. Like when I get into my car, like yesterday, for example, yeah. my wife and I were driving around in our Tesla or it was driving us around the Austin area for two hours. And my wife's just calmly in the in the passenger seat and that, you know, the car is taking us from point A to point B, no problem. And that thing is AI powered. It's like, what the hell? You know, my my co my yeah. copyright for my videos or if I want to do like a post and I want to check for typos, it's AI, it's GPT. It's helping me with that. It's so crazy. It's yeah. so yeah. freaking crazy. Yeah, you know? the, the impact is immediate and very apparent to everyone, which is like pretty unlike most tech phenomenons in the past where it took a while to get to everyone. Now, because it can get distributed freely through the internet, it's just like, oh, this capability happened. Everyone has it immediately. So it's like, it is a huge like field level, level or for lack of a better word. But yeah. the, the other thing I just want to comment on, um, I have plenty more time. So, but like when people say they're not that bright, I just want to go back to that because like this is a marketplace for ideas, right? So like pe I the reason I don't like when people say that is because you are you're clearly bright, right? Every both of you guys are clearly bright. M many of your audience I think is really clearly bright. What I try to do is I try to just offer a different set of data that just challenges an opinion that people take for granted and make it fact, right? Tesla will by far and away be the best AI company on the planet. That's an opinion. And we should challenge that opinion with things like NVIDIA's chips or Microsoft's co-pilots or whatever, right? Like the more data we can attack an idea with, the stronger the idea gets if it's real and the quicker it dies if it's not real. So like we should, I always try to get people to reframe the, hey, I'm not smart. I just think this. It's like you are smart. You just don't have all the data or, you know, your, your biases prevent you from seeing certain pieces of data. And so you've developed a narrative that's just like not in line with reality. So like that, I just want to point that out because many of your audience, I'm sure feels the exact same way. It's like, you know, oh, how can Tesla not be the winner? Well, let's just look at the data, right? So, yeah, no, I appreciate that, Alex. No, that's, that's, that's kind of you to say, I think, I, yeah, for me, it's like, when I make that comment, it's like when I think about like the total the total intelligence of the universe, and I view myself through that <laughs> yeah. lens, I'm like, yeah, I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah, me too. If, so if that's what we're comparing against, then I'm yeah. right there with you. Yeah. Like, no, I, I, and that's honestly, I, I'm, I'm uniquely like, I, I'm uniquely grateful and just so, so blessed to have the, the platform and audience and being able to speak like people, people like you and you know, having Hans as my partner here, this is exactly like why I love doing this so much is because we're able to sit down in a super respectful manner, just th talking about the ideas and talking about what is happening. You know, sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree, but like, oh. exactly what you said, like that's how you strengthen ideas. And if you throw your ego to the side and you throw it away, throw it in the trash can and just talk about the ideas, the truth starts to rise to the surface. And that's that right. ultimately that's the best way to, solve anything really you know i agree with that yeah that's a mic drop moment for sure i agree with that hans what, what else uh, what, yeah. yeah what else can i help you understand about hopefully you know nvidia but i'm happy to talk about other ai stuff too for sure sure what'd you have hans i, want, I was I don't gonna Alex say that too long either but yeah but go for it hans because we could keep him all day <laughs> oh i'm sure we could yeah i love i love that point as well you know when you said i love attacking ideas with data and i love getting a perspective 
from someone who sees the world completely differently than I do. Um, especially, you know, trying to dig down to what is the data that they're seeing that causes them to see the world in a completely different way than I do. And, you know, how much of that data can I actually learn valuable information from? So that's, that's awesome. That is part of the reason why Farzad and I have this podcast and we really enjoy this process, especially when we get to bring in someone who does have, you know, a really strong grounding and foundation in why they see the world the way that they do. And especially if it's different from the way that we see it, because, you know, sometimes we have episodes and we talk and we pretty much agree on everything and it's a fun yeah. conversation, but we don't really walk away from that having learned anything or changed or updated our understanding of the world and actually, yeah, really getting one step closer to reality. So we, you know, we didn't move. We're always some degree wrong. We didn't really get any less wrong you know, from a conversation like that. Whereas one like this, we, we actually do improve our, our understandings and that's a lot of fun. Likewise. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you this question then, and, and then maybe we can start sort of winding this sucker down. So sure. NVIDIA two to three years from now, sort of walk me through, walk me through what, what you see happening with that story, the world of AI, and maybe, maybe I don't know if I don't know if you're comfortable doing this, but maybe take us to 2030, like from 2024 to 2030. What does Nvidia's sort of trajectory looks look like? And and yeah, just help me understand maybe in the sort of I would call that medium to long term. How are you yeah. viewing this play, playing out? So I honestly think that if Nvidia does everything correct, so you know, lots of caveats, like they don't mess anything up, nobody critical to the mission dies, right? Like, you know, barring sort of like black swan events, right? My, in my opinion, NVIDIA becomes the biggest company on earth by a pretty large margin, kind of how Apple has been for a long time. And we have precedents of that all over the market. Um, and that's really built on two things. One, they keep extending their chip advantage. They're like foundational infrastructure for AI advantage and the world that just keeps eating it up. By that, I mean, Countries want their own sovereign AIs. You know, they want to protect their culture and they build their own GPTs as a way to do that, to ensure that things are being generated in their languages, in their cultural contexts, with their defense and their national security in mind, so on and so forth. So sovereign AI, at the same time, data center providers sort of acquiesce and say, hey, NVIDIA is our provider for like the biggest compute intensive tasks, the hardware for that. We're going to build around them. So you know, you have the NVIDIA H100s, the B100s, whatever is next on the horizon becomes sort of the heart of every AI factory and data center. And then NVIDIA extends that lock-in by offering the right firmware, middleware, software, and services on top of that to ensure it's not really, I don't think NVIDIA comes at this from a position of, we want to lock everyone in. That's not the idea. I think it's more like Elon Musk's approach to vertical integration. Hey, we want to tightly couple the software, firmware, and hardware because that's going to be the most cost optimal, energy efficient solution. If we can manage everything and have it work together, all of a sudden, the customer really wins that way. Apple does this. Tesla does this. It should be no surprise that NVIDIA is trying to do that as well. So what that looks like is the Omniverse becomes a much bigger piece of like what culturally professionals think about as, <clears throat> you know, I don't want to say the metaverse, but like a lot more people work together in the omniverse. It brings together a lot of skills that right now are disparate, but now all of a sudden, if you can make anything in any program, anyone with any program can leverage it. We didn't end up talking about the omniverse today. I'd be happy to come back to this podcast and tell you all about the different software side of things for NVIDIA, right? But my point is they're building that stack. And I think as that stack grows, you know, they're going to build more and more on top of it. And in the future, I believe we'll be thinking about NVIDIA as a software and services company that provides also the hardware that those software and services run on. Kind of like how Apple's a hardware company, right? Like, but they have plenty of software and services that people rely on for their businesses on top of that, right? right. That's by 2030, you know, 2030 is only six years away. So I Crazy. think that's where they are. You know, what the hell is happening with time? <laughs> it's like it's going so yeah. Uh, the last few years have been the, the longest decades of my life, right? Like so. this is what the singularity feels like. It's the the continual <laughs> acceleration. Yeah. yeah, it's nuts. 
So that that's my view. That's, you know, biggest yeah. company in the world by it probably a significant margin. And that's because it's the only AI company, in my opinion, that works with every other AI company and enables them to do whatever their AIs want to do. They're the AI platform, you know. How crucial is Jensen to that, to that actually panning out? Yeah, that's, it's a great question. So Jensen, as you know, is like the founder and CEO of NVIDIA. I think he's, he is very critical to that. But if, you know, if I was a betting man, he knows that too. This is again a should, right? So I got to be careful because I'm speculating. But he's probably trained a lot of people to start to think like him, at least in their domains, looking into the future, taking long-term bets, not worrying about making the money back right away, solving hard problems no one else can solve, thinking about hardware, firmware, and software integration, you know, on and on and on. If you watch all the interviews of Jensen, he's like very candid about how he thinks about the world, why he chooses to solve problems and not solve others. Staying in his lane, which means, you know, hey, if that's not a parallel computing problem, of course I'll let Microsoft solve that. Like, yeah, we could have made a few bucks, but instead we're solving this problem that no one else can solve, right? That's how he thinks about things. He's in a, he has, in his mind, he has 100% market share in every market that NVIDIA is in because NVIDIA is the only real player solving those problems the way they should be solved in his opinion. So my guess is the company culture has, is, has adapted that, right? So- my hope is there's not too much key man risk there, but that's a hope. That's not a fact. So, um, Hans, I saw you come off mute. I wasn't sure if you want to add something. I think that's actually probably a, I don't really have anything to add right now. That's not taking us down a whole new rabbit hole. One of the things I'd love to talk about, you know, in the future is yeah. Like what is the, there's, there's long conversations to be had about obviously Tesla bot versus the foundation that NVIDIA is trying to provide for yeah, other companies. Great. Yep. And then the, you know, the Omniverse is a huge one. There is the, the drive pilot platform. Yep. Um, those are kind of all long, long discussions that can be had, but then also, you know, this is one that's not as much in Farzad's wheelhouse, but it's one that we share in common is, uh, an investment thesis around Palantir and, you know, how does NVIDIA and the Omniverse and all of these things, how does that dovetail into what Palantir is doing with their Foundry platform, which is different than NVIDIA's Foundry? And, um, you know, what what does the future, what does 2030 look like for both of those products? Like, how does 2030 look differently because both of those products exist and what new ways, you know, does the world yeah. take shape, uh, you know, based on those realities? Yeah, that's so. a super cool discussion I'd be happy to have. I'd be happy to come back and like, you know, I, I happen to be one of a few people who actually had access to Foundry for a while, Palantir's Foundry. So it's like, um, I'd be happy to speak about my experience as much as I can, compare it to Omniverse, which I've, not really dabbled in, you know, but I, I know a lot mm -hmm. from going to GTC three years in a row and like that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot to say on those topics and I'm happy to share them. Okay. We got to have you back. <laughs> yeah, we got to have you back. Dude, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for making the time and thank you so much for, it's just uh, the, the amount of knowledge you bring forward is, is, is not only impressive, but it's, it's super helpful to understand the story. And so thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate it. Seriously. Yeah. It's my pleasure. I appreciate you having me, you know, of course. and hopefully your audience, you know, enjoys this episode. Oh, they will. <laughs> I can <laughs> they will. Yeah. For sure. Awesome.